lightning strikes throughout the night. Gufkin's feet is seen. As he walks down the staircase, he tells that a thousand years had passed since he was sealed by the warrior. But now is the time to start the task that was stopped a thousand years ago. Be prepared. The Rhapsody of Doom shall now begin. He yelled out. But a staff member tells Gufkin that he wasn't registered in the Demon King database, meaning he can't make a move now. Gufkin tells her what she meant by that, Rita explained that his ID had been frozen since he stopped paying for membership fees and that he can sign on once he pays his overdue debt. Gufkin asks her how he could have paid when he was sealed for a thousand years, Rita explains that they had an auto payment for that reason and that Gufkin owes 50 billion and more. Gufkin told her he could buy the world with that amount of money as Alex stares in complete silence of the situation. Back at the Demon King Support Center, Chuck Branch. It was explained that high-ranking demons and demigods monopolized the status of the Demon King, but now times have changed. Ogres, war beasts, liches, iron golems. This was an era where every species can become the Demon King. Hilti explains to Alex that all jobs for all species was the foundation of the guild, meaning anyone could join. But she tells him that there was one species that they were wary of. Rita tells Govkin that it would be hard to register the same name for him, this made him mad as he wants to use his own name and demanded to see the manager. Rita explains that the name Govkin had been used many times and it was at maximum usage as all the people in line were using that name, Govkin shouts out why there were so many of them, Alex asks him if this was important to fight against the warriors. Rita explains to Alex that war is short and conquest was long, and that the guild ensures that the demon king can retire once everything is done. And that the guild will help in managing the armies and tax collection and territory management. Rita and Hilti further explain that world conquest alone is hard, but with the guild it would be do able. Gufkin asks Alex if he understands now, but Alex says no. Rita then asks if Alex was registered in any guilds, Alex replies that he has never registered before. She recommends him to register as a demon king. Gufkin yells that's impossible, how can a servant leave him and become a demon king? He tells Alex to listen closely and that the path of a demon king is not easy. The title of a demon king is a path of suffering, a life where the only thing you can depend on is your sword, you will spend your days resting on the mountains of bodies. Eventually, your glory and victory will be fade. And all that's left will be your karma and spirits that stick to you like a shadow, their hatred and curse will become your life. Alex ignores Govkin's words and heads to the counter to register. He fills out the application easily. A new demon king has been born. Alex the demon I demon king. Rita hands him his demon king ID. Alex asks Govkin if this was all they need to fight the warriors but Gufkin tells him what is he saying and that they needed to buy a demon castle and get four devis, Alex grew mad wondering why there was a puppy as part of the four devis. Hilti tells them they could purchase those things with an extra fee loan but Alex declines. Gufkin tells him that they can take their time and do things one at a time. He says it'll be difficult to do anything for now. Gufkin tells him how less scary he would be when facing the warriors without the four devis or a castle. Alex tells him not to focus on useless things. Maria is seen walking through a long hallway. Someone is sitting at the table, saying that without the four devis in a castle, he wouldn't be able to attack as that was how the system was built. A flag is waving in the air, on top of a clean building. It was the warrior agency, Carton State. Warriors were selected from the direct line of the first warriors with aptitude and to take charge in subjugating and stopping the great demon king movements under the command of the twelve warrior generals. Maria reports she had returned from her mission. The figure tell her good job but she had failed to bring back the book of the warriors. And that she also failed to prevent the resurrection of demon king Govkin, she tells him she has no excuses, he holds a paper wondering how the greatest elite could fail both missions. Maria apologies and says she'll take on any punishment. The figure was the warrior general of the third unit, he tells her that there will be no punishment. He wonders if he should just tell the senate that they succeeded, he was also known to be lazy. 
reports that the general had submitted are shown where a pair of normal shoes were reported as a mage using invisible magic, a vampire lord that looked exactly like a normal bat and that a report by Warrior Kane states that Gufkin was sealed today, surprising Maria. Ha! Ah, surprised! This is the dignity of your senior said a shadow by the door, it was Kane the warrior. Maria asks him if he had really sealed Gufkin, and he replies that he had brought him here. He presented a goat as Gufkin the Demon King. He explains that the goat's features such as its horns and eyes were evidence that it was Gufkin the Demon King. The general signs deeply. And tells him he did it as he proceeds to stamp the report, Maria tells the general that he didn't solve anything. She tells him that the legend of Gufkin was not a lie and that they need to prepare all their forces. She explains that Gufkin was different. And that his strength and appearance could destroy mythologies. The general tells her he had read the report. He questions her whether he had split the moon with one swing of his sword and Maria tells him that the report was perfect without a single mistake, he then tells her if it was a goblin, turning Maria white. The general asks her if she was beaten by a goblin, Maria was embarrassed and said yes quietly, as Cain laughs at her for being beaten by a goblin. The general tells her that Cain will take over and that she will take on another case, Maria objects but he stares at her. Maria felt an immense pressure and the general asks her what her answer is, she said she understood. Maria walks back into the hallway. Kane appears asking her if she was planning to disobey the orders and go after Govkin and that he could clearly see what she was thinking. He tells her he could offer her some intel but she ignores him until he grabs her shoulder. Kane tells her that he understands her situation because of the some stinking bloodline which was why she was desperate to be involved with them. You should be thankful he said, as Maria Power start to come out. She calms down, saying the Chuck Spirit Forest in the southwest? Let's go, surprising Kane. He questions why she suddenly asked for help. She turns to him and says that upholding justice comes first. And that she had seen great evil demon kings that want to destroy the world for fun, but that Gufkin was different. Back at the office, the general is thinking deeply, saying that Gufkin wouldn't be a problem once that thing was complete. He stares at a capsule holding Ray's head. Ray's head was still alive as she says Alex. At the Great Wall. We arrive at Margam the Wall Village. Gufkin is panting with handcuffs. People are staring at something. Alex tells them to make way and that Gufkin is a well-trained familiar spirit and he won't bite, as Gufkin is tied up like a BDSM doll. Gufkin tries to talk but nothing is heard. At a tavern. Gufkin spits out the ball gag. He shouts at Alex telling him why he did that to him and that he wasn't into this kind of thing, Alex tells him to quiet down. He explains that dogs and goblins weren't allowed in the store, Gufkin is mad that he was compared to a dog. Alex tells him to hang on as this place will be worth it. He explains that this store serves Panu a sorted steak which was extremely delicious. Gufkin tries to leave but Alex grabs him by the ribbon on his helmet. He tells Gufkin that they were gonna try the Panu meal as well, Gufkin tells him that makes him weirder and why he would eat that. They continue to argue between themselves, grabbing the attention of the workers and patrons of the store. Alex tells Gufkin the story about the warriors saving the world from Gufkin's conquest which surprises him. The species of the continent were then split into the Demon King's army and the Alliance, Gufkin didn't like the fact that they were called army while the warriors were called the Alliance. Alex tells him to shut up and listen. The species that sided with the Demon King, dragons, vampires, werewolves, orcs and others were treated as monsters and ostracized till now. Gufkin tells Alex that he didn't know that happened after he was sealed. Gufkin regrets not being more diverse in selecting the soldiers for his army, and that he couldn't recruit humans because they were too expensive. A man appears at their talk as they were talking. It was Raziad, he tells them how dare a monster eat at the same table as a human and that they should get lost. Alex tells him not to worry as Gufkin was under his control, but Raziad meant that for Alex calling him a elf bitch. He continues saying that the Alliance had announced that elves from the Academy were classified as monsters. The staff agrees with Raziad, asking Alex to leave the store unless he was from their Alliance. Alex grabs onto his book, angrily. 
he calls them stupid humans and told them he won't eat and will just leave then, he calls for Govkin but he remained at his seat wondering why there weren't any ham egg sandwiches on the menu. Govkin asks Alex where he was going since they came to the store to eat, so let's eat he says. He tells the staff what makes them think this has nothing to do with you, and that the band started with dogs and goblins and now elves. And that soon dwarves, gnomes and other species will follow. Finally, humans will be divided by their skin color and origins because that was the warrior's way. Raziad smashes the table, saying that a monster shouldn't insult the great warriors. Gufkin calls him a half-breed between a giant and human, and to listen to what he says as the giants may be next, this angers Raziad. He swings his fist at Gufkin again, telling him to shut his mouth. Gufkin smiles as blood is seen. Back at the town. Alex tells Gufkin that he was really weak without a sword, he tells Alex to shut up as he just had his guard down for a moment. He tells Alex to heal him like a subordinate would but Alex tells him to just lick his wounds. Alex asks why Gufkin was so stubborn even when he didn't want to eat. Gufkin tells him it's because Alex wanted to eat and that as a boss he would not let his subordinate starve. Alex offers his hand to him, telling him that even though he can't heal him, he can offer his hand. They walk towards the setting sun, discussing their plans on ruling the world. At the northwestern part of the continent, the great forest of death, a voice is heard, saying give it to me. The voice belongs to the demon sword, Chutras. Who will give power to those that give up their soul to it? Argo, a human adventurer appears, saying he will give his soul or life in exchange for power as he grabs the sword. The sword agrees and gives him a power that best suit his soul. Argo then became Argo Chutras, a deaf knight. He talks out loud, saying he will make the humans who look down on him suffer in the name of Argo Chutras. Gufkin appears behind him laughing at his name. He tells Argo to think about his name a bit longer or else he will regret it. Gufkin asks him if he knew where they were as he had lost his way as he says Argo's name wrongly. Argos attacks Gufkin for saying his name wrongly. Argo smiles happily at the fact that a single swing was this powerful as the sword says that it didn't expect to have a goblin as its first offering but Argos realizes something. Gufkin was still alive and tells Argos he should change the arraignment of his name. He swings at Gufkin while Gufkin laughs at him. Gufkin continues to mock Argos for using the same name as the sword as little girls would do that while dodging all the attacks. Argos releases his skill Crimson Death. Gufkin jumps out of the way easily but Argos was smiling. Telling Gufkin that the skill cannot be dodged as light appears below the ground. It pierces Gufkin's body while Argos laughs at him saying serves you right but he notices something. Gufkin was still okay. The sword decides to release all its limit and to initiate its technique. Argos tells Gufkin consider it an honor, as his X-skill armored chuchur is activated. The skill consumes the life force from the surrounding to generate armor. Gufkin just stares in wonder. Argos had transformed into the complete form. I'll squash you like an ant he shouts. As he recalls the people that looked down on him. Gufkin tells him that stepping on an ant was a fun thing to do. Gufkin's shadows starts to come alive, as he tells Argos that strength like a god feels excitement but that kind of strength turns to nothing all too easily. In front of a bigger beast, as a giant eye appears from Gufkin's shadow. Argos screams that there was a monster in the shadow, as sounds could be heard. Gufkin then asks Argos if he knew where Erlen mountain range was. Feeling Gufkin's overwhelming strength, Argos politely points the way to the mountain just as Alex calls out to Gufkin, Gufkin leaves Argos. Alex asks Gufkin what took him so long and that he hated going up and down the mountain, Gufkin tells him he knows the way now. Gufkin tells Alex that they were gonna recruit the loyal orcs first into their demon army. Thanks for watching the latest part from the voice of Manwa. Subscribe for more content and don't forget to comment below what you want to see in the future. Like and share for more.